Great. Okay. Well, thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, hopefully the technology cooperates with us for the rest of the time. Um, so again, I'm Eli Meyer. For the last three years or so, I've been running uh, Aquabiomics, this strange new company um, doing microbiome testing and now DNA testing more broadly for the aquarium hobby. Um, it's such a small world, the aquarium microbiome world, that it's really rare. I get to talk to anybody who knows what I'm talking about, let alone is interested in it. So thank you all for tuning in. This is a great uh, chance to talk to people who are interested in it for a change. Um, so let's go through what, uh, what we're going to talk about today. My plan today is to start with a brief um, overview of why we're doing this, the motivation behind this project, um, tell you a little bit about how it works, try not to bore you with details too much. Um, if anybody does have questions about the details of how it works, I'm happy to address those uh, separately. Um, tell you a few of the stories that we've learned. Um, we've been testing aquarium DNA for about three years now, and you know that's uh, well over a thousand samples. Um, there's a lot more to be extracted from that information, but so far we've put together a few clear stories that have emerged. Uh, one of the subjects I want to focus on is pathogens. This is a obvious major concern. If a nasty fish or coral pathogen shows up in your tank, um, that's a problem and it's something you can really only see through uh, DNA testing. Um, we'll talk a, a bit about how you can adjust the microbiome, how you can change the microbial community once you've learned who's growing there and how many of them. How can you make changes to that community? And, and I'll end the talk today with uh, a brief overview of where we've been and, and where we're going next in the company. <clears throat> okay, so, so briefly, why are we doing this? Um, the chemistry of seawater is really driven by the actions of the microbial community that lives inside that seawater. I'm showing you here uh, a diagram, this is actually borrowed from someone's uh, dissertation. Um, grad students make the best figures, apparently. Um, I really like this figure because it showed clearly all of the different flows of nutrients within a reef ecosystem. Nutrients flowing from algae like phytoplankton to corals to fish in between all of these players in the reef ecosystem. And all of those flows of energy and chemicals are mediated by microbes, bacteria and archaea, these little invisible single-celled organisms living in the aquarium. Now, Aquarius already knew, if you focus in on the diagram on that fish, and notice that there's an arrow coming out of the fish, Aquarius already knew that microbes played important roles in uh, mediating these, these flows of chemi chemicals within the aquarium, because we knew that fish pee and somebody has to get rid of that fish pee. And we, and we knew that, that microbes are who's doing that. But the, di the diagram emphasizes that that's not the only um, flow of chemicals within the reef ecosystem that are mediated by microbes. Actually, there's, um, there's all kinds of energy flowing from corals, from phytoplankton, from other algaes, and all of these flows of energy are, are mediated by microbes. Okay, a lot of hand waving, but the point here is microbes are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the aquarium ecosystem and they're invisible. You can't see them. So how do you know if you have the right microbes or enough of them? Well, the, the way that researchers have turned, the method that researchers have turned to broadly to study these communities is DNA sequencing. Uh, rather than looking at the microbes physically, we examine their DNA to understand who's there and how many. So if the, if the microbial community is represented here by these, these uh, different colored shapes on the left-hand side of your screen, we use DNA sequencing to understand who they are and to understand their relative amounts within the aquarium. Um, I'll go into more details in a moment. Let's start with what the user does. So it all starts with sampling the aquarium. You um, order a kit from our website and you'll take two samples from the uh, microbial community in your aquarium. First, you wanna sample the water. Um, 
We use a syringe for this and you push that water through a filter, collecting the microbes on the filter. It's important you send us that filter, not the water itself. It's the filter contains the microbes. So that samples the, the microbial community that's floating around in the water of your aquarium. And we take a second sample uh, from the biofilm in your aquarium. I'll show you some, a good reason for this uh, in a moment. These are quite different communities, the microbes that are living on the biofilm versus in the water. So you take those samples, um, pretty easy process. We've got instructions and a, and a video on the website to help, you, um, to help you walk through that process. Um, and then you register the sample in our online database. This is an important step. This way we know whose data. Uh, we know we're able to give you your data. Is this screen flickering for everyone else or is this just me? It's just you. Okay. I will handle the flickering and we'll move on. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so you collect the samples from your aquarium. Um, you register the samples in our online database, and then you uh, pop them in the, the prepaid shipping envelope and send it back to us. Once the samples return to our lab, our first step is to extract the DNA from those samples. Um, and here we take advantage of a, a technology that uses tiny magnetic beads. The DNA binds to these tiny magnetic beads within a tube and we're able to wash away a lot of the other stuff that came along in that sample. Um, this is nothing we invented. This is a pretty standard method in molecular biology, but we've found that this is pretty important for uh, getting rid of some of the other crap that comes along in aquarium samples. They're pretty dirty to start with, and this allows us to get good, clean DNA out of them. Um, sorry, still dealing with some screen issues here. <clears throat> Um, once we've extracted this clean DNA uh, from your samples, now we're going to zoom in on the piece of the DNA that we're really interested in. So we're not studying the entire bacterial genome. Rather, we're just focusing in on one tiny piece of the DNA. And I like to um, use a silly analogy here. This is like trying to classify all the books in a library by just reading the first page of each book. Um, each book will have a unique first page, and that's how you can identify which book you're looking at. That's kind of what we're doing here. We're reading the same page from each one of the different bacteria. Um, now, if you're, a, if you're a, a biologist, you may be interested in the details. This is um, the V4 region of the 16S ribosomal gene. Um, for the rest of us, we can just think of this as a barcode. This is a barcode that we, that we read on each bacterial DNA to figure out who it came from. I'm trying to change slides here, but I can't really see them, so bear with me a moment. You're doing fine. Just... If you like, Eli, you can keep this view. You don't have to maximize the um, uh, presentation. This is also uh, okay. clear. I've had it solved. I realized we have a second computer here, so there we go. I can drive it on one computer and view it. Awesome, I love it. <laughs> so, um, so we, uh, we zoom in, we target this piece of DNA, the, the, uh, the barcode, the 16S DNA. Now, how do we target it? Well, we use a process um, called polymerase chain reaction or PCR, um, that really what we're doing is making billions of copies of this piece of DNA that we're looking for. Um, so the analogy I heard once for PCR that really stuck with me, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you make a billion copies of the needle, and now you don't even see the haystack anymore. That's kind of what we're doing with PCR. We make so many copies of this little barcode that that's effectively all that's left in the sample, and now it's ready for DNA sequencing. Now, there's uh, some important details here that I've skipped um, for your sanity and the sake of boredom, um, that piece of artificial DNA, the, um, the uh, little blue pieces on the, on the sides, these, uh, sorry, um, I'm not clear. Is this full screen for you guys? Sorry. 
Sorry about this. I just need to. Is there a way you can send it to him? Because he said if you if you send it to him, he can display it. I can't do it because I don't have access to it. I'm sorry about this, guys. Just pause a moment. I'm going to have to. Yeah, this solution wasn't working as well as I had hoped. Because I'm not able to change. Well, maybe I am. Yeah, I'm able to see your presentation. I mean, it's like it's, I'm seeing everybody else, but I can see your presentation as well. Oh. <clears throat> Okay, I think I'm I think I'm catching up. I'm sorry about this, but I, yeah, I think I think we're getting back to it. Yeah, no, worry at all. Okay, so we're now on the slide I intended to be on, and it looks like it's full screen. So I'm going to move ahead. Um, we've made billions of copies of this piece of DNA. Now we're ready to sequence it. Um, that artificial DNA, the blue pieces on the end of this diagram. Um, there's some important details there that I won't bore you with. These enable us, these pieces of artificial DNA enable us to sequence the, uh, the piece in the middle. Okay, the way that we sequence this um, is the same way that most, most researchers in a university or other settings do. That is, we send it out to a professional DNA sequencing facility just for this one step. Um, and that's because the instrument um, that I'm showing you here, the aluminum I seek, this thing costs something like a half a million dollars. It's out, it's out of the scale of, you know, what, what an individual lab or company can, can purchase. Um, so we, we send them that sample that's ready for sequencing. They sequence it and send us back the, the data. Um, the scale we're working at here, this instrument produces about 1 million DNA sequences, actually 1 million pairs uh, of DNA sequences um, every time we run it. <clears throat> and what do they look like? Well, this is the raw data that I actually get back uh, from the sequencing facility. Um, it's just a string of letters, A, C, G, and T. Each one of these uh, sequences that you're seeing is a record um, from a different type of microbe in the sample. This is how I get the data, but I suspect that if I were to send it out to my clients, they would not be very happy receiving their data in this form. So we do a little work with it um, to clean it up and make it make sense. Um, the first thing let's do to talk about how this works, let's stop looking at letters. Um, instead of those strings of letters, let's just imagine that the top three sequences were purple, orange, and green. Right? Different colors, different sequences, different types of microbes. In order to figure out each one of those microbes, where did it come from? Who is it? We compare these sequences with a, a database. This is, um, for this step, we use um, high performance computing supplied by Amazon Web Service. And we use some algorithms that were developed by people much smarter than me. And we use a database, very large database of bacterial DNA sequences that contains over a million different types of microbes. Um, so this is a pretty complex process, uh, but the user doesn't really have to think about it. I, I compare the DNA sequences with this database, and this allows us to tell who's there, what kinds of microbes are we looking at. So the purple one in this case was Flavobacterium, and the green one was Nitrosococcus, and the orange one was Rosy Virgia. Um, the point is, the DNA sequence tells us the identity. Who are they? The, the next piece of information is much simpler. That is, their amounts. Um, to get this piece of information, we simply have to count them. How many times did we find the purple sequence and the orange one and the green one? And this tells us something about the relative abundance of the different microbial types uh, within the sample. <clears throat> so what does it look like? Well, I want to start with this view of the aquarium microbiome. Um, there's deliberately no labels here because the labels can be kind of distracting. Uh, I think we can actually extract a few interesting pieces of information from this view of the aquarium microbiome. 
Uh, in this view, each circle represents a different type of microbe. The size of the circle represents its abundance in the sample, and the color represents which family it belongs to. So a few things you can see. The abundances are not all equal, right? There's a few highly abundant types. There's a few more moderately abundant types, and there's a whole lot of rare types swimming around. Um, you can see that some families are much more abundant than other, right? Look at this sort of pinkish purple one. There's lots of different types of that guy. And the blue one, there's fewer types. And I'm leaving off the uh, labels deliberately just so we can think about the big patterns here. And the other thing I want to say about this, this diagram really uh, represents how much we don't know about the microbial community in the aquarium. The gray circles in this diagram, there's maybe four or five gray circles in the diagram, those represent the microbes in the nitrifying community. Those are the microbes that most people in the aquarium hobby knew something about. Those are the ones that chew up ammonia and nitrite to clean the water in your aquarium. But those are a small subset of the community, right? Most, all those colored circles, we really knew very little about. <clears throat> so let's start putting some names on them. Um, we like to look at these communities at a family level. The reason for this is you can make some good generalizations at the level of family in terms of what these microbes do. Um, so, we can start here with the pink family, the Pelagibacteraceae. If you look on a natural coral reef, if you were to take a sample from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, this would be the most abundant kind of bacteria, the most abundant family of bacteria that you would find in that sample. And in many aquariums, it's also the most abundant family. Um, but we've, we'll talk more about this later in the talk. Um, we've found that there are some practices that have a really strong impact on how much of this group you have in your, in your aquarium. This is a free living group specialized for um, low nutrient conditions like you find on a healthy coral reef. The orange family, the Rhodobacteraceae, this is another very common, common group in the, um, in the aquarium community. These guys are associated with um, biofilms, so they're the dominant member of the, um, the biofilm community. When you send in that swab sample, most of it will be Rhodobacteraceae. They're also all over detritus and other surfaces in the aquarium. Um, and they play important roles in breaking down uh, leftover food, nutrients within the aquarium. I won't go through all of these, but I will point out just one more group, the pinkish purple one down at the bottom of the figure, the Vibrionaceae. This is another important family of bacteria to pay attention to because this family includes a lot of important pathogens. Um, now, it's not a problem to have this family in your aquarium. We always find this family. It's um, almost universal. Um, in fact, these are directly associated with corals and anemones. They literally live on the surfaces. So having the family in your aquarium probably just means that you have corals and anemones in the tank. But as I said, there are some important pathogens in the group. So if we see a high level of this group, um, that's worth looking into. And, and then we start looking at the individual species and asking if there are, are pathogens. So uh, I showed you this first without any labels, now we're talking about the specific families um, that are within the, the community. Um, that's, that's one thing we've learned about in, in this um, sequencing project that's underway is what is the normal community of a reef tank? And it's, it's what I just showed you, those, those five or six major families make up the normal community of a coral reef tank. Another interesting thing we've learned um, in this process, uh, I should say we've confirmed this, uh, you know, people knew this all along, uh, that the communities in the biofilm and the water of your tank are very different communities. I'm not showing you all the families here. I've highlighted just a handful of families um, that I'm really just focusing on because they show such strong differences. You can see that the Pelagibacteraceae and the Alteromonadaceae these top two groups, 
these are mostly found in the water sample, right? Big blue bars, little yellow bars, mostly water. They're very rare in the biofilm. And the opposite is true for the other two families I'm highlighting, the Rhodobacter ACA, the Hyphomicrobiaceae. These families are abundant in the biofilm, rare in the water sample. Um, so this was, this was one of the things that uh, became apparent early on in the process, and we actually had to change our sampling kit and sampling protocol. This is the reason that we include a swab in every uh, microbiome sampling kit, um, because it's important to capture that com component of the microbial community as well. <clears throat> so um, we've, we've started you know, at the really big picture level, and I want to zoom down now to a very specific group, the nitrifying community. This is one of the functional groups that everyone in the hobby um, was already interested in and you know, concerned with. We, there was a good background in the hobby, good background knowledge, knowing something about the chemistry of uh, nutrient processing in the aquarium. We already knew that ammonia is processed into nitrite and eventually into nitrate. Um, this is a detoxification process. What you're seeing here, um, the more toxic forms are converted into the less toxic forms. And we knew that there were groups of microbes doing this, right? The ammonia oxidizing microbes chew up the ammonia, the nitrite oxidizing microbes um, chew up the nitrite. Um, so we, we had a lot of good background knowledge about this beforehand, but we didn't know, what we didn't know was who's really doing most of it in the aquarium. So after a few years of sequencing, here's what we can tell you. Um, all of the players that we, you know, all of the uh, nitrifying community members that we, we were expecting showed up at some point, but by far the most abundant groups were just these two. The ammonia oxidizing microbes are mostly this family, the Cine archaeaceae. This is a, a group of um, archaea. They are not bacteria at all. So, um, most of the ammonia that's produced in your aquariums is actually not degraded by bacteria. It's degraded by archaea. Um, there are ammonia oxidizing bacteria, but they make up a much smaller fraction of the community. Um, and within the um, nitrate oxidizing bacteria, by far most of these are in the family of nitrospiraceae, mostly uh, in the genus uh, Nitrospira. Um, so this is, this is one thing we've learned about the nitrifying community is who are really the common players in the nitrifying community? And it's these two. Um, another thing we've learned about the nitrifying community is uh, the relative abundance of these groups within the aquarium. So um, again, this kind of confirms what was expected, but it puts some numbers on it uh, based on real data. So the Nitrifying community broadly turns out to be two or three times higher in biofilms than in the water. And I think this, this largely agrees with what the aquarium hobby community would have expected. Um, but I have often heard it kind of overstated. I have heard hobbyists sometimes say that there's no important bacteria in the water. Well, I'd point out here that there's a lot of water in the aquarium. And these are, um, you know, the data I'm showing you here are the, the percentage right, the percent of the community in the water that is ammonia, or, uh, ammonia oxidizing or nitrate oxidizing. Um, so yes, they're less abundant in the water than in the biofilms. Um, by far, they're most abundant in the biofilms, but there's actually quite a lot of them in the water too. <clears throat> um, another uh, interesting quantitative piece of information that we've learned from, from these data is that the ammonia oxidizing microbes, the AOM, are consistently much more abundant than the nitrate oxidizing uh, bacteria, um, typically about 10 to 15 times higher. Um, so there's just a lot more of the ammonia oxidizers uh, in the aquarium. And this becomes an important issue to be aware of um, when you think about variation across tanks. So we see huge variation in nitrifying community levels across tanks. Um, Coming into this, hobbyists often describe the tank as being cycled or not cycled, as if this was sort of a yes or no distinction. 
And really what we're seeing is that it's a continuous range of levels. Some tanks have high levels of nitrifying microbes and some tanks have low levels and everything in between. Once you get down into the very low levels, uh, the nitrate oxidizing bacteria can actually fall below the limits of detection. And so we're seeing this in some people's tanks that their communities, their nitrifying communities are so low that we actually can't even detect the nitrite oxidizers anymore. So uh, summarizing some of what we've, we've learned here, we've, we've identified the important groups of nitrifying microbes in the tank, and we've uh, found characteristic quantitative patterns. That is, there's always a lot more of them in the biofilm than the water. There's always a lot more AOM than NOB. So putting a lot of really specific data and numbers on this information that we already knew about the nitrifying community. <clears throat> now the nitrifying community, at some level, you could evaluate that through chemical tests of your tank water, right? And in fact, those are very valuable, uh, very valuable tests. But here's some, here's some kinds of microbes that you never could have figured out just by doing chemical tests in water, and that is pathogens. So this is another important group of microbes to think about in the aquarium microbiome. If the nitrifiers so the good guys, these are the bad guys. These are the ones you don't want to show up in your sample. So I'm highlighting here a couple of bacterial pathogens of fish. These are the two most common that we find in samples. Um, Vibrio fortis. Uh, this is a member of that family Vibrionaceae that I was pointing out earlier. Actually, both of these are members of that family. Um, Vibrio is, uh, Vibrio fortis, that is, is by far the most uh, prevalent bacterial pathogen in the hobby. We find this in uh, almost half the tanks that we sample, but it is usually not a major concern. Uh, the reason for that is, as far as I know, this has only been directly associated with disease in seahorses and their relatives. Um, while those are certainly kept in the hobby, they're not in every reef tank. So uh, lots of people have Vibrio fortis in their tanks and are not experiencing any any fish symptoms. Um, still might be useful to know it's there before you put an expensive pipefish in your tank. Uh, the second most common bacterial pathogen that we find in the hobby is, is P. damsolae. Um, so this is an important emerging threat for global fish aquaculture. There's many papers written about this, this pathogen and the, the harm it causes in fish aquaculture. There's much less known about its effects in the hobby. One of the important things we don't know is we don't know the full range of fish that are susceptible to this pathogen. Clearly the damsel family is susceptible. That's actually where it was first isolated and um, known to be susceptible. So this includes damsels and clownfish um, and chromis, things like this. Um, this is again, a pretty, pretty prevalent one in the hobby, about a quarter of tanks have this one, maybe 20% of tanks have this bug. Um, while it often shows up without any documented cases of you know, fish death or symptoms in the tank, we think it's contributing a lot to deaths of newly introduced fish. Those mysterious deaths where you put a healthy fish into a healthy tank and it dies quickly, uh, bugs like this, I think are contributing to those, those incidents. <clears throat> Wanna turn now to another group of hosts. So we'll talk about uh, bacterial pathogens of corals. I'm going to show you first some photos um, from the field. Now these are photos of a coral that's almost the size of a coffee table. This is a huge colony. Um, and uh, the photo was taken, I'm very proud of this, by a student who once volunteered in my lab back when I was serving time in academia. Um, she, she has since gone off to do very interesting things and has been down in the Caribbean taking photos of these corals as this disease, the unfortunately named SCTLD, stony coral tissue loss disease. This disease is sweeping through the Caribbean. It's a major ongoing problem. And these photos do a great job of showing how quickly it progresses. So again, this is something about the size of a coffee table. Here we are at the beginning of February. Here we are later in February. And here we are by mid-March. This coral is completely bleached, completely dead. Um, giant coral, 
within within a month and a half wiped out by this disease, which is um, most researchers now agree uh, bacterial in nature. Um, there are still differences of opinion and ongoing um, lots of ongoing research in this area. Um, now, one of the really interesting things that came out recently, an excellent paper um, published by Clark and colleagues in microorganisms, they identified nine bacteria that are um, strongly associated with this disease. So this is based on field work going out and studying, you know, diseased corals and comparing them with healthy corals. <clears throat> Excuse me. They find nine suspected pathogens. I want to emphasize that again. Um, you know, we have not, they have not, and the field has not conclusively settled on the pathogen causing the disease, but these are some suspected pathogens that are strongly associated with it. Um, we find four of these in tanks in the hobby. A um, couple of them are pretty common, occurring in almost 20% of tanks, uh, the Shimia species and the Planktotelia species. Um, the other two are, are less common. Now, the emerging or the, the ongoing research on this disease suggests that these bacteria act as a group rather than as individual pathogens. And so it may not be a major concern if you find just one of these in your tank, especially if it's at a relatively low level. That's a pretty common situation. But because the research suggests they act as a group, um, when we find multiple different types, like the shimia and the planktotalia, both in your tank, then we start to get concerned. And we've seen a couple of cases, interesting cases recently, where um, clients with um, lots of ongoing tissue necrosis in their corals, uh, especially LPS corals, um, had extremely high levels of these. So um, we're, we're pursuing those, those cases and taking direct samples to, from the corals to follow this up. Um, it's, it's an ongoing area of research. We don't know a lot about how these pathogens are acting in aquaria, um, but more and more, it looks like they are associated with disease in aquaria, just like they are uh, in the wild. <clears throat> Turn to another bacterial pathogen. This is another suspected bac bacterial pathogen. I keep saying suspected because we haven't done key experiments. You have to fulfill a certain number of steps in order to formally designate these things as pathogens. Um, one of those steps is deliberately reinfecting a coral with it and causing the disease. Some of these things are difficult to do. With that said, with that uncertainty out of the way, I'm quite certain about this one. We've seen it so strongly associated with the disease and we've now seen it cured so many times that it seems pretty clear this is the pathogen. Okay, so the one I'm talking about here is an unidentified or an unclassified Archobacter species. It's in the genus Archobacter, which is a genus known to have some other pathogens. And we find it strongly associated with brown jelly disease in, um, in corals, especially euphilia corals, um, like this torch coral uh, shown here. The torch coral that I'm showing you here is not the prettiest torch coral picture you've ever seen, but I'm proud of it because I took it. The picture next to it, which shows a, um, a different euphilia species, I did not take that, but it's one of the nicest ones I could find on the internet illustrating this, this terrible disease, brown jelly disease, where the healthy coral tissue just melts down into this brown ooze. And that brown ooze turns out to be primarily a soup of this Archobacter species, type 1103. Um, now there's some good news about this. This is a terrible pathogen, but uh, we have found a surprisingly effective treatment for this pathogen. Um, so I'm showing you here a couple of pieces of the evidence, the effects of this treatment on the microbial community. What I'm not showing you here, because I just don't have good pictures, is the effects on the corals. If you get brown jelly disease in your corals, I suggest you attempt treating with this antibiotic, ciprofloxacin or cipro. Um, for an in-tank treatment, I use this very low concentration. If you're using dips, you may wish to experiment with higher concentrations. I'm not showing you the effects of this treatment on the corals, but it's a good effect. 
in, in my hands and in many other clients' hands, um, this treatment has been effective in um, stopping the progress of brown jelly disease. Once a coral melts into brown ooze, it's lost. But if you catch it early, you can save corals with this low dosage of Cipro, even for an in-tank treatment. The first piece of evidence I want to show you is what does it do to the archobacter? So the, the punchline here is a low dose of Cipro effectively gets rid of archobacter. The first bar, the pre-BJD bar, you can see there was no archobacter. When archobacter, when, uh, when brown jelly disease showed up in the tank, there was also a very high level of archobacter. That's the brown bar. Um, and after my treatment, after I treated the tank with Cipro, you can see that the archibacter was now gone. It was back down to zero, okay? So low dose of Cipro kills archibacter. What does it do to the rest of the stuff in your tank? Well, it turns out that it doesn't have any really negative consequences at this low dosage for the rest of your tank. So here's the community um, before the brown jelly disease. You can see it's dominated by this pink group, the Pelagibacteraceae. The middle bar shows the community during the brown jelly disease event. You can see that the microbial community was disrupted by this bacterial event in the tank, this uh, rotting of all the coral tissue. For my treatment, you go to the third bar and you see that it's more or less back to where it was originally. So treating your tank with this low dosage, very, very careful low dosage of Cipro actually did not wipe out the community. It restored it to something much more like the normal community. Um, and just by way of defending that statement, here's a picture of the typical community. Um, you can see that the, the Cipro treatment really has brought it closer to that. It has high levels of uh, Pelagibacteraceae and lower levels of the Vibrionaceae. Okay, so Cipro kills Archibacter. It doesn't kill the rest of the stuff in your tank. Um, so that was, that was the first of the statements I wanna make along this series of what can you do to influence the microbial community in the tank? Well, one thing you can do is you can uh, try to get rid of the bad microbes, right? Things like pathogens. That, so uh, 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 antibiotic treatment is one very extreme example of what you can do to alter uh, the microbial community in your tank. Um, let's turn to another example of how you can alter the microbial community, or in this case, how you can establish the microbial community in the first place. This was one of the first experiments I did after setting up my uh, new company because, you know, we in the hobby, we, we knew that this was effective, the use of live rock, uh, but I hadn't seen it quantified well. So I wanted to really quantify this. So we set up some experimental tanks and I'll emphasize here replicated tanks. If anybody's interested in doing experiments like this, really important to have replicates of, of each of these um, different treatments. Um, and we tested a few different kinds of rock. I had some good live rock, I had some fake live rock and I had some dry rock. And what you can see very clearly is that within just a couple of weeks, live rock uh, establishes uh, a really diverse community. Um, the dashed lines on this figure are the percentiles from studying uh, other people's reef tanks, right? From, from our database of other reef tanks. So my point in showing you these percentiles is to say that after just about a month with, with high quality live rock, the, uh, these newly established tanks had already reached the median diversity. That is, they were, they were uh, right in the middle of the pack of, of long established reef tanks um, within a month. So, so very quickly, live rock can very quickly in two to four weeks establish a, um, a community, a microbial community that has a diversity comparable to a, a reef tank that's many years old. Dry rock, on the other hand, Look at that, over that first month, more or less a, a flat line, uh, really very little increase in diversity in that month. Um, so live rock makes a diverse community. It also helps to establish a typical community. Um, now I'm, I'm picking out here just a few families to illustrate this point. Um, on the top row of figures, what you see are a few families 
that are typically present at relatively high levels in the, Amer in the aquarium microbiome. Um, so that's the blue bar, that's the typical level. And you can see that the, um, the good live rock, the, the red bar, established a community that had similar high levels of these families in it. In contrast, look at the dry rock. The dry rock had very little or undetectable levels of these families. Now look at the, the bottom uh, panel of figures. Um, here I'm highlighting families that are typically not present at high levels in a reef tank, but in a dry rock tank were present at unusually high levels. Um, so overall, I think this does a good job of demonstrating that if you start a tank with live rock, not only do you establish a more diverse microbial community, you establish a community that is more like a typical long established reef tank. <clears throat> so that was, that was a point about how to start a reef tank in the beginning, how to establish that community in the first place. Um, but of course, we all have reef tanks in our homes right now, and we may wish to alter the microbial communities. I have another treatment that I can show you some data on for existing reef tanks. Um, and that is live sand and mud. Now this, uh, the live sand and mud that I'm um, showing you data from today, the experiment that I'm presenting, uh, this is not our product. This is not our live sand and mud. This was actually purchased from uh, floridapets.com. I've gotten live sand and mud from them a few times, always had really good results with it. So they're, they're a great resource for this kind of thing. Um, we are now also selling some live sand because we found this was such a need in the community. So as we, as we discover these effective treatments, we're trying to bring them in house. Um, and, and so we do have our own live sand available now too. I think there's one or two uh, units of it available if anybody wants to buy it. We're just about sold out. Oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It did sell out this morning. Okay, um, so if you have a nitrifying community in your tank, that doesn't have enough of the nitrite oxidizers. This is a very common situation. I don't have a, a good number for you, but perhaps 20% of our clients are in that situation. Um, what do you do? How can you establish a good nitrifying, uh, nitrite oxidizing community? Um, well, what we're showing here is that uh, live sand and mud are a very effective way to do that. The data show two tanks, tanks B and C were never treated. Um, so those are my controls. You can see that, um, during the course of the experiment, either the before and after for those tanks were always quite low. Um, nitrite oxidizing bacteria didn't just emerge by chance in the experiment. The treated tanks, A and D on the right-hand side, um, these were treated with live mud and sand. The left bar on each of those, you can see is actually zero. So before the treatment, they had zero nitrite oxidizing bacteria. After the treatment, they had nice, normal, high levels of nitrite oxidizing bacteria. So if you want to inoculate NOB into your tank, here is one way you can do it. Put some live sand and mud in there. Um, but that's not the only effect it has. Live sand and mud actually have um, quite a dramatic effect on the, the microbial community in general. Um, so I'm showing you here the community composition plots for the same tanks. Here are tanks A and D. Those are the ones that I'm going to treat with, with uh, live sand and mud. This was the situation that I was faced with. These are two of my tanks. And I looked at those, I looked at those communities and I said, these communities don't look right. Um, they have way too much of the red stuff, the Altera monodaceae, and they don't have anywhere near enough of the pink stuff, Pelagibacteraceae. This was an undesirable community, so I added something to change it. And here's, here's what happened. You can see that in both cases, the red stuff went down, that is the Altera monodaceae decreased, and the pink stuff went up, the Pelagibacteraceae increased. Now, you'll notice that the communities don't look, diff don't look identical at the end. Um, and, and I think that's... Uh, not surprising. These are quite different tanks. These are not replicate experimental tanks. These are my home aquariums. Um, but in both cases, we got a we got a change in the same direction. Right? In both cases, it it increased the NOB 
it increased pelagibacteraceae, it decreased the Altera monodaceae. Scores improved across the board. The uh, control tanks, where I didn't add anything, you can see that they did not go through these changes. Right, tank B started dominated by red and it ended dominated by red. Um, and tank C, another control, in that one, it actually moved in the wrong direction, right? The pink went down and the red went up. So very clearly live sand and mud had a dramatic effect on the community, um, both in terms of the overall composition and in terms of the uh, nitrifying community specifically. So turning now to another way you can alter the community in your tank. The way that you uh, plumb your tank, the kinds of equipment that you used in your tank, this also has a strong influence on the, the microbial community that grows there. Um, the strongest effect we've seen in this regard is, is the use of UV sterilizers. Um, UV sterilizers have an incredibly strong effect on the microbial community. You can see this if you look at individual um, examples. I have some example tank profiles on the left. These are real world tanks. One of them has UV, one of them doesn't have UV. Um, and you can see there's a big difference in the pink, right? Pelagibacteriaceae are absent or rare in the presence of UV. And they tend to become dominant in the absence of UV. Now that's just one tank, that's an anecdote, but let's look at, let's look at data, let's look across the whole, the whole database. And you can see that on average, if you have no UV sterilizer, you have a much higher level of Pelagibacteriaceae than if you use a UV sterilizer. Actually, I've gotten um, so convinced by this pattern at this point that when I find someone who claims they have a UV sterilizer and I find a little bit of Pelagibacteraceae in their sample, I tend to write them and ask them, you know, what's different about your UV sterilizer? Is it, does it have a lower, uh, maybe a, a higher flow rate that makes it less effective? Maybe the bulb has burned out. It, it's such a strong effect that I'm, shocked if I see these bacteria present in the, in the presence of UV at all. Um, and people often ask me, you know, does it matter? Um, this is a very important question uh, that I, I can't pretend to have the conclusive answer to. I have not done the experiment that demonstrates you want to have a lot of Pelagibacteraceae in your tank. What I can say for sure is it's, um, it's the dominant group on a natural reef so if we think that there's any interaction between the microbiome of the water and the microbiome of the coral, and that's, that's really widely accepted at this point in coral microbiology, then it must matter. It must matter to make such a, a huge change uh, to the microbial community. Corals in nature encounter mostly Pelagibacteraceae. Corals in a UV sterilizer tank almost never encounter them. Um, but we'll all have to stay tuned until someone can do the experiment that really measures, you know, what are the effects of this, this group on, on coral health. Um, okay, so, so that, was, uh, that was my effort to show you that the things that you do in your aquarium make a difference in terms of the, um, in terms of the microbial community that grows there. Um, before we take questions, I wanna, I wanna close today by, um, talking about the development of the company and where we've come from and, and where we're going. So um, I th I'm thinking about this in phases. Um, the first phase we've, we've lived through now. Um, in the first phase, we introduced microbiome testing. That's the subject of today's talk. Um, we've also introduced tank DNA testing. This uses really the same technology, but targeting a different group of organisms. This is how we test for um, non-bacterial parasites. So we've had both of those tests up and running for some time now. Um, and we've also started offering in phase one, a, a supplement, uh, Live Reef Rebel. This is um, developed from the same material that I showed you in that experiment earlier, that good live rock, live rock B. It's exactly the same material that we're using to culture this uh, Live Reef Rebel. Um, for anybody who's waiting patiently for the next batch of live reef rubble to come in stock, me too. Um, international shipping is, is hard for all of us right now, and it's really impacted our ability to get more live reef rubble in stock. We think next month we have more. 
Okay, that's phase one. And phase one um, has been characterized by some frustration over the, the, the time scale. It's, it's frustrating that it takes a month to, to get these data back. Um, in phase two, we're addressing that. That's our main goal. We wanna speed up the turnaround time of these tests. Um, so there's two things we're doing here. One is, one is simply as the number of clients has increased, we're, um, we're about to move to two batches a month. So no changes in technology, just simply two batches a month so that in principle, we should be doing um, twice as fast turnaround time. But we have also, this is a very exciting step. We've also purchased a, a new sequencing instrument. I'm actually showing you, showing you that sequencing instrument on the slide. Um, this is a complete sea change in, in the DNA sequencing world. So the old model of DNA sequencing was these instruments cost a half million dollars and only sequencing centers can afford them. The new model is the instruments cost a thousand dollars or a couple thousand dollars and every lab can afford them. Um, of course, it's going to be an enormous amount of work transferring our technology from one sequencing platform to another, but that's the nature of DNA sequencing. We have to do it. Once we have this machine up and running, this is going to really increase the turnaround time because it'll mean we don't have to outsource that, that step of uh, sequencing. So that's the phase that we're currently in, making this transition from one batch a month to two batches a month. Um, in this phase, we are also introducing some new supplements. Um, so we've introduced live reef sand. We've, we've got a couple suppliers now, um, and we've been doing lots of testing on this material and, and selling this as much as the live reef rubble. We also have some uh, prebiotics that we're developing. And I wanna make the distinction here between prebiotics, which are nutrients that promote the growth of one type or another of microbe, and probiotics, which are really microbes themselves. Uh, we're, we're currently developing a couple of different uh, prebiotics that we hope to launch in this phase. Um, finally, the, the vision for the future. Um, there are times you want an even faster test. Um, and so we're, we are um, planning, this is our next growth step, um, to develop rapid tests that are specific QPR, qPCR tests for individual pathogens. So the testing, um, if you send in a sample um, and ask me, do I have ick? We can do a qPCR test on that. And the, the plan is to be able to turn those samples around within about two days. Um, again, that's the future. We're not there yet, but that's, that's where we're going is these very, very rapid tests for uh, individual pathogens, um, along with the slower tests that show you the, the whole community. Um, other things we're developing are farm SAN. Actually, I have a, a batch I've been cooking for a few months now that we're about to start doing some experiments with, and probiotics, that is um, bacterial cultures. Um, now, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of bottled bacterial products on the market right now. Um, and I don't want to say anything that angers any of those manufacturers. Um, I actually haven't done a lot of testing on those products, trying to prove or disprove them, anything like that. But what I want to say that's going to be different about our probiotics, they will come with ingredients. They will come with scientific data backing them up. So you will know what kind of bacteria you're putting in your tank and exactly what that bacteria can be expected to do. Um, yeah, that's, that's the vision for the future. So stay tuned. Um, okay, so I've gotten through all the slides that I had for you. Um, again, thanks for your patience and uh, listening to me talk about aquarium microbiomes this morning. Uh, so if, if there's any questions, I'm happy to go through the questions um, that came up during the talk. This is awesome. Thank you so uh, much, Eli. We have a bunch of questions on the chat. Uh, do you see the chat? Or uh, if not, I can read it uh, back to you. Sorry, bear with me for a moment while we try to deal with these. Um, if you have difficulties, no problem. I can uh, read the questions one by one to you. So no problem. Is there a mute? 
Okay, let's try. I don't think I'll be able to hear you all. You can talk from here. Yeah, I think the first question is from Tim Fish. Correct. Okay, I'm here. I can hear you. Well, you know, you know, we could do two, um, Omar. We could just have people ask questions. Yeah, and, let's do that. Yeah, just unmute everybody and let them ask the questions. Correct. Ah. So uh, everybody can, wh whoever would like to um, ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and go for it. We can start with uh, Tim Fish. Let me know if you're having problem unmuting yourself. I can, um, let me see if I can unmute everyone. Um, yeah, he may have dropped off the chat. I mean, his question was, have you tried looking at individual coral colony microbiomes using swabs? Gotcha. Can you guys hear me? We got it. Okay. Um, we've done very little of that. We are, we are starting that process now as kind of a follow-up. That is, if somebody, if somebody shows up with, uh, a tank that has coral pathogens in it and has some coral disease in it, then we will, you know, send them swaps for a follow-up. I, I haven't, I haven't done a lot of that though. Okay, there was a question from Liz. Is Liz still here? Well, see, I can- Yeah, hi. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, so I tried the aquabiomic Cipro routine, um, and it does seem to stop the funk on the philias in its tracks, oh, and great. everything everything rebounded, and then it came back a little bit, like four or five months later. Hmm. But then, so I hit it again with the Cipro, and then I think you mentioned this in the chat, but I noticed there was like one hammer that had come from a local fish store that just still had the funk and I pulled it. I actually gave it to um, Vince, Omar knows Vince, and he tried something else on it. But once it was out of my tank, everything's been fine since. That's great. So it seemed like maybe there was one damaged coral that was not, was resisting treatment and harboring pathogens. But once I, it, the, the Cipro helped me kind of isolate it, it was that one and I plucked it out. But my question is, um, do you have like long-term data or results since trying your own Cipro treatments that shows like the offending bacteria, brown jelly or whatnot, you know, stays at bay long-term? That's a, it's a great question. I haven't followed up uh, in quite a while. Um, I did a couple of measurements, maybe weeks to a month or two afterwards and didn't find it, but um, I still have those both of those tanks up and running. I should I should retest them. I'm sorry. I'm going to try getting on the other microphone because I have quite an echo here. Um, so so I guess my my answer to your question was that no, we haven't done a lot of long term follow up. Um, it may be your data that I'm thinking of, but we have at least one client who has described results like yours to me. That is, they did the Cipro treatment and um, later saw Archibacter coming back. You know, it, it was effective in getting rid of it. They didn't detect it afterwards, but then later down the road, it came back. And this has made me suspect that we, we may want to extend the duration of this Cipro treatment. Um, what I originally described, I think, was about three treatments, something like three days apart. It's somewhere on that neighborhood. Um, and, and I think it might be reasonable to consider extending that for longer. You know, we, we know that from antibiotic treatments in, in medicine, certainly, that it's important to, um, you know, take the antibiotics all the way to the finish the course of antibiotics, right? Um, so I, I think your observation may, may be pointing us in that direction that these, these Cipro treatments should be extended for a bit longer. Um, unfortunately, I don't, have, I don't have the experiment to, uh, to clear all that up. Eli, do you mind if I follow up a second? Please feel free. So uh, Eli found um, Arcobacter 
um, in, infecting my uh, Ghani Opera collection. And I did the in-tank treatment of the Ghanis. Um, however, we fragged up pieces that were infected. And it seemed like in some pieces that the infection was systemic. Mm -hmm. It was deep, deep down in the tissue. And I found that doing uh, high concentration Cipro dips on the heavily uh, infected uh, individual coral colonies, that was the only thing that worked. I did that in combination with the intang treatment, and I'm still wait I'm waiting on my new results from Eli, but that has, um, it seems to have completely solved the problem in my tank. So I think that there's some corals that get a really deep systemic infection that just, it they need a little bit more. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, these are, these are such weird organisms we're trying to treat, right? I mean, they're a big chunk of rock with tissue somewhere inside of it. It's, it's easy to imagine that it might be hard to get the medicine into, you know, where it needs to go. So maybe the Cipro treatment gives you like a first round visibility into which coral may be the one you know, if you see one that's still kind of struggling after the treatment, you might know, oh, that's the one that brought the funk into my tank and is harboring like a deep infection. And then you can pull that one and take it aside instead of all 20 in your collection. Right. Um, if I could interject here, uh, what's the possibility of there being genotype specific responses here on both part of the parasite and on part of the coral? Uh, how do we identify that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess my, my general answer to that has to be yes, right? There, there must be. Um, uh, well, well, in it, my it, case, it was a frammer. It was a frammer. I had one frammer, and that was the mm -hmm. issue. The frog spawn, the hammers, and my torch spawn were all the ones that were okay. But mm -hmm. the frammer seemed to be the one harboring pathogen. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I just haven't done enough... Um, I guess none of us have done enough experiments on this, right? To, to systematically test, are there, are there different euphilia that are more or less susceptible to it? Um, you know, I, I guess I can say something at the level of the, um, the pathogen genotype. Um, that is, there's lots of different archivactors that show up in these samples. Um, you know, so it's not just a question of finding any member of this genus. It, really I'm flagging a specific DNA sequence here. Um, so that is when I tell you that you have, you know, you the client have type 1103 in your tank, it means that it is the identical DNA sequence down to a single base pair as the other guy that had type 1103 in his tank. And um, my point in saying that is, you know, that that's sort of as specific as we can get for the, for the pathogen genotype. Mm -hmm. We really are identifying it down to that yes. specific DNA sequence. Um, and I have not found that DNA sequence um, associated with disease in the literature. Um, there are other archobacters associated with coral disease, but not that particular one. Oh, so I, suspect, I suspect there are differences uh, in terms of susceptibility, yeah. So on that same token, I, I saw a couple of, re I mean, I saw a research a while back uh, talking about using amoxicillin. Well, it, it, actually, it's using ampicillin, I believe, to, mm -hmm. to treat some of the, um, um, I think they call it uh, white band disease. Mm -hmm. uh, is, it, is that similar to the application of the uh, Cipro or like, do you have any, any opinions for or against? Right. Well, so um, in terms of, I guess a few things to say there. One, um, there was at least one pipe, you mentioned white band disease. There was at least one paper that uh, implicated a type of archibacter in um, white band disease in, mm. in at least one coral species. So, I mean, it's a very relevant um, example to bring up. Um, in terms of treatment with antibiotics, um, I think if you're doing a treatment outside of the tank, that is as a dip, I think it's entirely reasonable to go for kind of a broad spectrum mixture of antibiotics with a goal of wiping out lots of bugs. Yeah, what I saw is topical use, yeah, to, to, just to yeah. be clear. It was a topical use, correct. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, you know, 
coral disease research in the field is often quite challenging, right? How are you going to treat this coral out in the ocean? Sometimes they do in the field treatments with like an antibiotic ointment. I know that's that's happening now with this SCTLD. Um, if if you can, you know, you can take the corals and put them in a in a separate aquarium, sort of a quarantine tank, and you know, do a do a high concentration treatment there. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is I think it's reasonable to go with relatively high concentrations and broad ranges of antibiotics if you're doing a, a dip or quarantine tank treatment. But if you're doing an in-tank treatment, then I think we need to be really, really careful um, for a few reasons. One, if you, hit, if you hit the community too hard with antibiotics, you really are going to start wiping out things you don't want to. Um, the, my choice of Cipro here was based on reading up on Archibacter and finding that Archibacter was really, really sensitive to Cipro so that I could use a very low concentration of this one and, and hope, to kill Cipro, hope to kill Archibacter, but not other bugs. Um, so so if, if one is experimenting in tank, then I think one should be very careful with dosages and the choice of antibiotics. But if you're doing it in a QT or, or a dip or anything, then I think it makes a lot of sense to go, you know, with higher levels and, and uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Have you tried doing any experimentation with, the, I think it's enrofloxacin is a derivative of Cipro. I know with fish diseases, um, it has similar efficacy than to Cipro, but it's not as harsh on the nitrifying bacteria. So you can usually actually dose that in a quarantine tank. That's really cool. No, I haven't. Uh, enrofloxacin, is that? Yeah. Yeah. And cool. it's, also more, it's also more readily available. I think NFT uh, will sell that, but they don't sell Cipro. So it's just yeah. easier for people to get, you know, sometimes. Yeah, Very I think good. Like, no, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, no, I, answer your question. No, I haven't, but it sounds like it sounds like a really productive area to look into. Yeah. I think it's also known as Batril. I might be the, you know, the name brand for it. Yeah, great. Yeah, boy, there's an endless array of experiments that we as a, as a community need to do here, you know, testing, testing various different antibiotics. Um, but yeah, this, all this done by the end of the year, right? That's right. Yeah, should be no problem. <clears throat> But what I love about the testing is it makes it a quantitative discussion. It's not, I used this antibiotic and things seem to get better. Yeah. You know, it looks better. It's like I quantifiably measured how much of the bacteria before and after. Yeah. Well said, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we go to the next question. Um, so I have a couple of questions sure. I, I inspired from your talk. Uh, so, uh, you, you talked about the, the value of uh, live rocks. So I have a little bit of allergy from anything like wild collection. So my questions yeah. will be around that. Uh, so first of all, do you recommend using live rocks from an existing tank instead of uh, wild collection? Of course, there are risks. Do you have any procedures or uh, uh, recommendations to avoid these risks? My second question is kind of similar. So you can answer them both. Um, we absolutely understand the value of, of live rocks, but with the eco um, uh, impact uh, from wild collection, do, do you have any recommendations about establishing similar benefits uh, with more eco-friendly matter? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, let's start first with the idea of taking, taking material from, from one tank to another. Um, you know, I, th I think this is a great... I guess, let me say, I don't see any reason it shouldn't work, right? You know, if the material, if the material was, um, was good in the first place, uh, you know, it should be a useful way to transfer from one tank to another. We've certainly seen some cases where people set up tanks in this way and establish, um, you know, good microbial communities very quickly by transferring the, uh, the community from one tank to another. Um, I, I do think that uh, it's gonna it's gonna matter what tank. Forgive me for saying the obvious, but it, it's gonna it's gonna matter a lot what tank it comes from. Um, you know, 
uh, we've all probably visited lower quality fish stores that were selling something they were calling live rock and you looked at it and said, yeah, that's a wet dead rock, <laughs> you know, um, so and, true. right. And so, you know, a, a rock from a tank established with one of those may not be so useful, you know, testing can help with all of this, right. Um, and, you know, and, and another, another part of that concern is, well, what if there are, um, parasites coming along with it. Um, it's, it's really not a gimmick that we test our live reef rubble. About 50% of the material that we have bought has come in infected with uranema. So the, you know, and I think, I think the humble fish community understands this, right? How, how prevalent parasites and pathogens are in the, in the hobby. I, I was honestly kind of shocked, you know, wholesaler tanks are so dirty that half the rocks you get from them have your name on them. Um, so, so yeah, it'll matter which tank you get it from, right? So Eli, would you, yeah. would you say running a, a, a test uh, from you say uh, right. on, a, on a tank would be a good way to reduce the risk? Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we do. You know, it's, it's all we can do, right? Is um, the, the only technology we have available for, for figuring out, do I have, a parasite in this tank is is to sequence it, and so that's what we're doing. And when we get a batch that shows up with uranium in it, we don't sell it. Um, Small you know, follow up. I trust the results. Yeah. Is it about the volume? Like when when you add live rocks, mm -hmm. you get the benefit only if you have a lot of live rocks. I usually start my tanks with like ten to twenty percent live rocks, where yeah. it is just like a bunch of live rocks. I spread them. Right. Do, do you have opinion there? So I mean, I I share your um, I share your opinion that I think that that practice makes sense. I think, you know, that has been my practice too. That is not to use a hundred percent, you know, the, the aquascape in my tank is not built out of live rock. I'm using live rock as, as an inoculant. Um, and so I'm certainly putting in a small amount relative to the total rock. Um, so I agree with you. I don't have data on it. You know, I haven't I haven't gone in and measured a tank with 100 pounds of live rock versus 10 pounds or whatever. Um, I think just stating the obvious, you know, the bigger the tank, the more rock or the more time, right? It's it's going to take a long time for that community to colonize the whole tank if it's a large tank. Um, and we can overcome this by putting more live rock in 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 principle, but um, so while agreeing with what you're saying, I just, yeah, haven't done the measurements to, the caveat, to put numbers on it. Um, so, so we discussed a bit of, you know, moving from one tank to another there. Um, you, you also asked about um, artificial sort of substitutes for, for live rock and how to minimize environmental impacts of this. Um, and yeah, this is, this is on our minds for sure especially as it becomes increasingly difficult. I mean, putting aside any environmental impacts, you can't even get the material these days. Um, so uh, yes, I think, I think we all need to be thinking about how to develop you know, a, a, a farmed substitute, an aquacultured substitute for real live rock. Um, I think parts of this are very achievable and I don't think there's any reason to doubt that it can be done. Um, there's no reason to doubt the microbes could colonize, you know, new clean material and even coralline algae and other stuff could colonize it. Um, I think an important detail for us to, to deal with as we develop this will be the kind of substrate that is the, the kind of rock itself. Um, I'm a big fan of real coral skeleton whenever possible because of its porosity. Um, there's a lot of stuff sold as live rock that is like non-porous purple painted cement on the inside. And then it has, you know, a skin of live stuff on the outside. Um, but if you crack open real live rock, it's, you know, there's stuff all the way through it, right? So I think that detail will be a real challenge, how to get, how to get a good, um, you know, artificial equivalent of a coral skeleton. But I, I think the, the vision of growing farmed live rock is absolutely possible. So I don't want to rat hole you into a topic yeah, you know, I know usually yeah. you try to avoid, but, but okay. do you see benefit of 
like with, with, with like bacteria in a bottle to would, would that yeah. be part of the solution what's your there so yeah i mean it, what can i say about these so i think that there i think there is a place for the various bacterial products that are out there on the market i'm not i'm not a person who says you know we should get rid of them all and they're all snake oil or something um with that said i think that maybe some corners of the hobby have over applied to those is that a safe i, I hope that's a safe thing for me to say um yeah so so in other words you know there's some on label applications for these things that the manufacturers are making claims and and those claims are probably okay but then there's a lot of off-label applications. Um, and one of them is I hear people talking about adding a whole bunch of different bacterial products to their tank in order to build diversity. And I'm I'm gonna say, you know, I hope this doesn't offend any manufacturers too much, but I'm gonna say I think that's a complete waste of time. Um, I think it's a horrible practice, actually. The, yeah. <laughs> these these bacterial products don't have many types in them. Um, maybe one to seven types in any given I, I've tested a bunch of them and they don't have a lot of diversity in them. Furthermore, the kinds of bacteria that we find in them are not the kinds of bacteria that we find in aquariums. So I have some real doubts without putting any names or numbers on anything about how long this stuff even lives once you put it in the aquarium. So, I, I mean, I think that's an example where I would say, you know, I would not recommend adding a bunch of bottled products in order to build diversity. But if it's a question of, you know, quickly establishing a community that can handle a fish, right? People do these things for like quarantine tanks and various, you know, rapid setup tanks. You know, I think there's a place for that, right? People have shown clearly that they can be useful for, for handling, handling ammonia. Um, I haven't done much testing with the microbial products that are marketed for cleaning tanks. So I really, I can't express anything about, about. I couldn't that. agree with you more. Honestly, anecdotally, I have seen issues where people will add different types of bacteria from a bottle and then they start dealing with say cyano. And I think, I mean, this is uninformed, but I think part of the reason is we are adding all these microbes, they die, immediately in the tank and then you start dealing with these spikes from organic matters from from the yeah. death of, the, of these bacteria which spike mm -hmm. things like cyan cyano that's my hunch but sure yeah i mean all those dead bacterial cells that's nutrients right and if you smell any of these products you know crack open the bottle and smell it um <clears throat> they all smell like bacterial culture media um which means they're full of nutrients, right? And so when you pour those nutrients into your tank, that is altering the microbial community in the tank. Even if there were no bacteria in the bottle, just the nutrients are doing something. Um, we actually yeah. see characteristic signals, a couple of families, Fusobacteriaceae um, and sometimes Alteramonidaceae, families that um, show up at high levels and, and I say, ah, I bet you're using a bacteria in a bottle product and I go look and in fact they were. Um, so yeah, I, th I think adding these products that I guess what I'm saying is that that is another concern I have about these products is all of the nutrients that get added along uh, along with the bacteria. If uh, if it would be okay, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. If, go ahead, okay, I'm done. If I uh, brought up something on the same topic where we're talking about like uh, taking uh, wild live rock and bringing it in, I think there is a decent amount of aquacultured live rock going on in Florida, at least that, I mean, definitely varies in quality depending on the distributor. And I'm not sure what the availability across the country or globally is for that. But we, at, at least in the shops that I've worked in here and seen a few, uh, a few others, there is some decent aquaculture live rock that they grow out for about four to five years on mined aragonite that seems to have good results, at least in my experience. Yeah. Jacob and Eli, are, you, are we worried about shipping? I mean, do these bacteria survive shipping? So I, I can't say, I mean, I can't say I've run any tests myself, but every, every tank that I've set up uh, using this rock from, I wish I knew the name of the distributor, but it's kind of something I haven't been privy to from my old bosses. But every tank that I've set up has been fully established within a few weeks to a month without any fish being added. Uh, very, I sometimes add bacterial supplements as just an extra way to develop it. But I, I've, uh, 
I've had very good results with it and I've never had any tanks have issues with Beautiful. it. I don't usually see cyano or anything develop. So Eli, I'm sorry, you are on mute by the way. So we didn't hear what you said. I don't know if you can hear us. I hope you can still hear us. Well, Link, can I just say we just actually, and this would be interesting, we just actually added a new vendor on the forum, uh Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Saltwater, which you know a lot of people know was was they were a good source for live rock and then they they kind of shut down for a little while. Now they have new owners. So I think it would be interesting um to maybe get a sample from them, um, our, our tanks that are set up with their rock, just to see what what comes back um, with that. Um, but I had one other question. It was actually something in the chat. Um, and someone says it's from Carrie H. Speaking of ick, if the current test comes back with no ick, is it is it still possible to have it in the system just at such low levels to be undetectable? And I, I've, I've had a lot of people ask me this, that if they have ick or velvet or some other you know pathogen, whether it's a parasite or bacteria in the water, is it possible for them to get an eDNA test, but it comes back negative, but then it's just basically like a sublethal or very low concentration of, of parasites or, or, or bacteria in the water? Um, I hope we didn't lose Eli. Eli, are you still with us? You are on mute on your main uh, login. I think you're... Uh, might, have, might have lost him. Yeah. Maybe we. He might be. Uh, maybe. Them. Yeah. Poor guy. So so I'll make sure also I I uh, get all the questions and I'll send it to him in case, uh, so he can maybe answer these questions on the form if need be. I'll just uh, say, Jacob. I think that uh, one of the main. <clears throat> excuse me, one of the main vendors of live rock that I've had good success with is KP Aquatics in the Keys. They're pretty well known. They are, they have one of those live rock um, farms out in the yeah. Keys. I, the live rock that I get is from a local shop that I used to work at. And uh, the story, as I know, goes that my boss walked into a shop that had the same rock when he was working in South Florida, met, got in contact with the distributor and then started selling it. But he doesn't really tell me who it is because... <laughs> I guess it's his trade secret rock for now. <laughs> at, at least he doesn't like to share things like that. But I, I've, I, I've, I find very good success with that rock and the uh, variety of not not just my uh, microbes that come on it, but also a lot of uh, like flora and fauna that appear with it. I mean, there's some pests like with any aquaculture live rock, but overall, there's there's a lot of great clams and gorgonians, uh, sponges, corals, all sorts of stuff that come on there. Um, I, mean, I use. Yeah, no, I ahead. use Gulf Live Rock. Um, been using that for years. It's been pretty good. And I've seen on the forums and people have been really happy with both Tampa Bay and with KP Aquatics. I think KP Aquatics actually sells like little packages for smaller tanks too, which Gulf Live Rock doesn't do. Yeah, I think that very, very much helps with minimizing uh, environmental impact. I, and I, I don't know. So I'm going to reach out to, no, I think, I think just talking to my KP, I think I'm going to reach out to them about becoming a, you know, a general livestock vendor. Cause I think, you know, it seems like a lot of these problems, whether it's disease or whatever, kind of started when we, we, we got away from using live rock and everybody's like, Oh no, just set up, you know, use all dry rock to set up a tank and dose some bacteria in a bottle. I think if, if we could maybe get back to if not completely, but at least using some live rock when you set up a new system, maybe some of these problems that we keep seeing on the forums maybe would would be mitigated or, or yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Um, and if we looked at the point. research coming out with sponges, you know, the cryptic sponges are doing some phenomenal things with uh, the DOC and system. So I mean, I, I couldn't see establishing a healthy reef system without uh, at least some mariculture or wild live rock. So. It's a, uh, and, and we're, I mean, like, I, I think it, everybody's completely right on that. And I hope that like the community that we're a part of is yeah. able to really put that into practice. Working in a shop setting, I found it's very hard to convince people to go that oh, route. Yeah. It's very hard to convince newer people getting into the hobby or people who have even been in the hobby for a while to like actually use live rock. Sometimes it's just the cost or sometimes they've just seen a random video that says how bad live rock is and it comes with aptasia and that's the end of the world but it's like it's Absolutely hard to it's hard to voice all those 
Show a yeah. picture of dinoflagellates. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have never had dino, dino or cyano problems in any of the tanks that I've set up with live rock. I mean, I've had it appear, but I've never had it be like a plague to the system. I see but, Melissa is back. Let me just make sure. Melissa, can you hear us? I don't know if I'm guessing you guys reset it. Ah, oh, here's Eli. All right. So, so Eli, I'm sorry, we did not hear you when you were talking regarding the shipping. I don't know if you had a, a comment. Otherwise, we go through the rest of the uh, questions. Yeah, I mean, my my answer is a combination of I'm not sure because we haven't measured the before samples. Uh, in other words, I've never gone and measured what does the community look like at the wholesaler before he ships it to me, right? Um, with that said, the way that we ship this material, you know, we uh, we ship it the same way that we ship live corals. Um, that is, um, you know, one to two day shipping, temperature controlled, just like a, just like say a soft coral. Um, and so we're sort of doing the best we can, you know, pretend it's an invertebrate and 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 treat it that way. Um, I think there's every reason to believe that most of the microbial community can survive a short period of time shipping. I am. I think you also ship submerged. I have seen rocks that ship with, with like wrapped with paper yeah. and by the time it reach the paper is like dry and still the vendor will be like no no it's okay they can survive with that, that i don't know you ship submerged <laughs> so it's that, different. that's right ours are shipped in water i mean that's right. that's my feeling is let's just treat it like a like an invertebrate right, you know, right. as comfy as we can um i'm sure there is some die-off and i'm sure there is some changing in the community during during shipping but um it seems that we are able within sort of two day shipping timeframe to transfer a healthy community. I wanna be mindful of your time as well. Uh, we can go through the rest of the questions. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, please stop whenever you wanna stop, okay? We, we took uh, more than, we are almost two hours. So feel free to stop whenever you want, okay? Thank you. Now let's keep going, we're good. All right. Uh, Bobby, do you wanna to go to the next question? I think you, you will be better than me. My questions are done, so maybe we can go to Teodoro. Yeah, I'll just try to go through the list here. Uh, now, someone had asked, uh, I think it was Carrie had asked about, so basically like if someone sends in a water sample and let's just say that they they have ick in their aquarium, but it's such, it's such a low, the parasites are at such a low population, I guess this would also apply to harmful bacteria. Is it possible basically for that not to be detected by the eDNA test, like you have it in the tank, but the eDNA test comes back clean because the concentration of parasites is so low. Is that a scenario that that happens sometimes? Yeah. So you know, there's definitely a a, um, a limit of detection for for these tests, um, and so it's in theory it's absolutely possible that there's something in the tank that we're not detecting simply because it's so rare. And that's going to be the case really with any sequencing based technology. Hell, even, even qPCR, you know, has a limit of detection. Um, so I think, I think part of the answer is it absolutely could be that we're missing something that's very rare. We can, we can do some statistics on that and say, well, how rare would it have to be, you know, in order for us to miss it? Um, but it, I don't think I have any really satisfying answer there. It is possible to miss something that's rare. With that said, I also want to I also want to look at the other side of the coin, and that is, okay, you have a fish in your tank. You know, you, the hypothetical client somewhere, have a fish in your tank with some spots on it, and and you're convinced it's ick. And even if we all agree that that is absolutely ick on your fish, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's established a population in the tank. Um, you know, until we were at a point where we were sampling water and testing for the presence of parasites, I think we were largely assuming it was there, right? If, if there's a sick fish in the tank, there must be a viable population of parasites in the tank. And I'm just raising, um, I'm raising the point that, that, is, that that's not known. You know, it, it could be that there is a population of cryptocarrion in your tank, and it could be that there isn't, even though you have an infected fish uh, somewhere in the tank. Um, I'm not sure in any individual case, which one are we looking at? You know, the best we can do is say, look, when we see ick, it's present at this level, 
And if it was present at this level in your tank, we would have detected it, right? It could be present at some much lower level and we didn't detect it. That's, that's possible. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, here's a, a question from Riley. Will the cost of samples change as your sequencing technology changes? I'm finding myself in a bit of an awkward spot of wanting to take several samples, but not able to make a big purchase of many kits to get the bulk rate, but then having to pay the high per unit price of buying single kits. Got it, got it. Okay, so I mean, a couple of things to say there. One, um, no, actually this new technology doesn't, doesn't change the cost. It's funny, our, our reagent cost will be almost identical to within about $20, um, that is for a batch. Point is almost no change in cost. Uh, but there will be a really nice increase in quality along with it. So um, uh, I don't an anticipate a change in cost, but things are going to be better in several ways. One, we will be able to classify a greater fraction of the bacteria. So right now, right now, um, there's some of the sequences that we can't classify. We can just say, you know, that's... Uh, that's some member of the family Vibrionaceae. Um, but with longer sequences that we're gonna get from this, um, from this new technology, you're gonna get um, much better classification. Um, so no change in cost, improvement in quality. The question about price, um, yeah, if you're interested in doing multiple samples, but you don't wanna buy them all at once in order to get that, um, that bulk subscription rate or that bulk discount, one option is what I think I saw Andy suggest that you could do a subscription model. Um, but I'd also say, you know, send us an email and we can work something out. We have a few um, like public aquaria that we work with that we do things like that for, you know, they, they're going to sample, they're going to run 50 samples altogether, but it's not all at once. So we give them a discount rate and just split it up over multiple, um, multiple batches. So yeah, if if the subscription rate doesn't solve um, doesn't you know give you what you want, then contact us and we can work out some other kind of package. Yeah. Okay, sounds mm -hmm. good. Uh, here's a question from earlier question missed. Uh, do the microbial composition of tanks inoculated with live sand mud remain diverse and correct long term without any ad in additional intervention? Yeah, very good question. I, I wish I had the answer in terms of numbers. Um, I've I've got to confess, even though I'm running a DNA sequencing company and like you know testing aquariums, um, my my aquariums are not ideal experimental aquariums to test in many ways. Um, they haven't been stable over years, and so I haven't I don't have these nice long term records of my own tanks. I'm kind of embarrassed about it. I should. What I can say is my practice. My practice is I test my tanks periodically. I don't test them, you know, every month, but I test them periodically. Um, and in my own tanks, I do add more live sand or mud periodically when it appears to be needed, either based on observing the tank. You know, when I see nuisance algae problems, I love live sand and mud for this. Or if I do a test and find low diversity, uh, low balance, I'll do it then. So my practice is to add some more at some point as needed, but not to do it preemptively once a month or anything. Does that help? Okay, yeah. so are there any other questions? I don't, I mean, I, I know we probably missed some in the chat box, but we wanna be mindful of, you know, Eli's time and everyone's time, you know, it's Father's Day. So if anyone has any questions, if you could type it into the chat box quickly or just, you know, unmute yourself and ask Eli the questions. I no, also made sure I record all the questions and I will send them in an email to Melissa and uh, Eli, and then uh, we'll post his answers on uh, on the same thread. So no worries if anybody missing something. Sounds like a I, I just, uh, I had a question that I posted up earlier and that I know the, I know the, I, <laughs> I, I know that prim primarily uh, the tests are run with reef tanks in mine and uh, stony corals and other and other similar things, but I run some odd systems where I run uh, right now an MPS and macroalgae tank with a miracle mud substrate, and I'm also working on a seagrass tank with a weird mix of substrates. And I'm wondering if the tests you run would still be applicable for those, and if if you had the database DNA-wise to make it uh, worth the time sending those tests in. Yeah, so 
you know, at some level, at some level, it really doesn't matter what the sample comes from. Um, the databases that I'm comparing these DNA sequences against are um, intended to be pretty universal databases, and I should be able to detect them equally well, you know, whether it came from freshwater or saltwater, et cetera. Um, so at one level, the answer is no problem. I, I can test it just like if it was a, salt, uh, a standard coral reef tank. It's really in terms of interpreting the results that I think it becomes kind of a challenge. Um, in other words, you know, if you send me a, a sample from a, um, a primarily macroalgae tank, I expect that's going to have quite a different microbial community than a, than a reef tank. Um, and so you're going to get like a low balance score, right? And you're going to find that you have some families unusually high, some, um, and, and what do we make of that, right? Does yeah, that, I, it's unhealthy I, or not. That's yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm fine with you with being able to try and interpret that myself. I'm trying to yeah. wrap that up into maybe some undergraduate research at some point. So <laughs> just getting an idea of what I have going on, but I, I was just checking if it'd be okay to still send those in. And if you want me to like preface it with some information that it's like this sort of system rather than you put it through, oh, here are my results that everybody has for their reef tanks and this weird seagrass tank is skewing everything in some way. Right. Yeah, so that is that is good information. Thank you. It's that's right. I do um, I do exclude weird tanks from the database because when I'm comparing the client's tank with the database of typical tanks, I don't want to have those oddball tanks, you know, in in the database I'm comparing with. Um, so any information you can give us is very useful for us. Yeah, but but I'd say if you're interested in the results, feel free to send them in. Um, we have the standard report that we do that is intended for reef tanks. Um, and I can make that. I can also make kind of a more general report that we do for unknown samples. Um, that is, if somebody just sends me a, a tube of bacteria and wants to know what's in it, or, or a swab from a coral or whatever, we can just give you a printout that's basically a list of everything that's in the sample. Um, so yeah, regardless of the origin of the sample, we could give you um, those two views of looking at it. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Um, Bobby, do you want to close? Yes. Yeah. Let's let's go ahead and wrap this up. Um, Eli, we just want to thank you. Uh, you know, for taking the time to uh, to do this presentation, uh, taking you know time out of your Sunday and everything, and uh, we're we're very grateful. And uh, we will try to get this um, this video up on the YouTube channel as as quickly as we can. I. I Lately, I've just, it's time. My, my problem is time to get it done. But we're going to get this on the YouTube channel. And we thank you. And we thank you for being a, a great uh, uh, vendor uh, on the Humble Fish Forum. Of course. Well, hey, thank thanks. You. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for the chance. And thanks for the forum at Humble Fish. I mean, that's, the community has been, has been very useful in the development of this. So, yeah, thanks to everyone. Thank and you so much, Eli. Happy that was wonderful. <clears throat> right. Bye.